Hello, everybody. I'm Jill Hammonds. I'm the membership director at this fabulous, fabulous museum. Lucky me. I'd like to quote something to you that was in the San Diego Union Tribune on May 21st, 2000, and I quote, talk about a bad idea that just won't die. <laughs> Here we go again, explaining why a rusty old aircraft carrier moored at the foot of Broadway as a tourist attraction is just really stupid. There's no reason to believe that tourists would be attracted to the thing, certainly not 600,000 a year, which is the promoter's conservative estimate. That's more than our world-famous maritime and aerospace museums attract in a year together. No matter how many arcade games or lights you hang on the thing, the Midway is still going to be nothing more than a very, very big hunk of rusted gray metal. Its technology is moot, its beauty is relative, and its history is pedestrian. Boo. It will cost millions to tow it from its birth in Bremerton, Washington and outfit it as a tourist curiosity. Although the backers say they'll raise all the money, they haven't yet. And when the enterprise fails, as it certainly will, underlined, who will pay the price towing it north again? because it will have to be towed back when the scheme flops." Unquote. Oh yeah? Well, guess what? What? Time Magazine just released a list of the top tourist activity in each of America's 50 states, and when it came to California, it wasn't Disneyland, it wasn't the Golden Gate Bridge, it wasn't Hollywood, and it wasn't even the Redwoods. It was the USS Midway Museum, number one. It is the hottest ticket in California. Last year, we had 1.4 million visitors. It was the eighth consecutive year in a row of record attendance. We've educated and inspired over 55,000 kids, and now we have 19,000 members. That's huge. <laughs> Plus, we are ranked the fifth most popular museum of any type in the United States and the 22nd most popular museum of any type in the world. Us. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, let's get serious for a moment. One of the most influential people that helped bring the USS Midway to San Diego through all the difficult 12 years and many battles of bureaucratic, bureaucratic red tape and outrageous outcries from the it's an eyesore citizenry is here tonight. No one has been more instrumental in charting Midway's course to where we are today than our friend Patty Roscoe. Patty is a Buffalo, New York native and moved in San Diego in the 60s. She established one of San Diego's most respected destination management companies and became a leader in the tourism industry nationally and internationally. She has held prestigious volunteer leadership roles for decades and has received many lifetime achievement awards such as San Diego, San Diego Convention and Visitors Bureau, San Diego Rotary Club, and the International Special Events Society. Patty led the Midway Community Relations Program that resulted in San Diego being awarded the USS Midway, and she is now on our foundation board. Please help me welcome Patty Roscoe. Thank you so much. An eyesore, my foot. <laughs> Boy, were they wrong. It all began in the 1990s when a local entrepreneur named Alan UK had the vision of converting an aircraft carrier <clears throat> into a museum of naval aviation. How hard could it be, he thought. Alan had passion, commitment, and determination. What he didn't have was a ship 
a location, approval from the Navy, support from the local political community, or financial backing. That, however, did not stop him. He doggedly put together a team of a dozen passionate people who helped make the dream come true. He rec recruited his team well, and it eventually became the first board of the USS Midway Aircraft Carrier Museum. Included were David Floor with amazing business acumen and a real love of history. Rear Admiral Riley Mixon, former commanding officer of the Midway. John DeBlanc, a brilliant public relations expert. Dick Burt, an attorney. There always has to be an attorney. And he was one of the best. Pete Latrenta, with respected expertise in public affairs. John Hawkins, an entrepreneur with know-how and connections. Ed Fike, a distinguished newspaper executive. Wright Reinders, president of the Convention and Visitors Bureau. Jim Brook, a master of fundraising. Vince Benstead brought a much needed public accounting expertise. Rear Admiral Ray Burke, former commander of the Boston Navy Yard. Recruiting Ray was a challenge. He felt the shit wouldn't be maintained and would end up a bucket of rust. We showed him our detailed repair and maintenance plan and he was hooked. And there was me with a background in doing special events and community service. Strategy sessions were held on next steps to fulfill Allen's vision. An application to the Navy was required, and it said we had to find a surplus ship and a hole in the water to put it. A business plan had to be developed. A minimum $3.5 million had to be raised. Approvals were required from many local and federal government agencies. We needed unwavering support from the local community, and we had to meet strict environmental regulations. We studied a success story. It had taken Texas less than a year to birth the USS Lexington in Corpus Christi. How hard could it be? That was Texas, we're California. <laughs> but we found out that California is not Texas, and it was very hard. In 1992, the USS Midway was decommissioned in San Diego and sent to Bremerton, Washington. She was scheduled to be dismantled and scrapped, so getting her was our goal. The Midway was the longest serving aircraft carrier in the 20th century, and she had an amazing history of fighting battles in three wars and making it through them all. As a result, she was called Midway Magic, and that's what we called her. She was to be our ship. The Navy Pier seemed the perfect locale for a Navy ship. That was to be our location. In 2004, five, David Floor took on the job of completing the required application, which on the surface appeared to be an easy process because it was only 15 questions. None of us realized how challenging those questions would be. David ultimately became our task master, making us review our budget at every meeting, line by line. This magnificent ship would not be here today without David's painstaking work and continued financial commitment. David, where are you? David, stand up and be recognized. You are an amazing individual. And I know several of our colleagues are here tonight who were there at the beginning. Would they stand as well? Come on, stand up, there they are. Okay, so we needed seed money. We all contributed enough to get us through the next two years, or so we thought. When our bank account dribbled down to $300, remember that, David? <laughs> we realized we needed a lot more money. We hired a fundraising consultant and created the Plank Owner Program. A Plank Owner, for those of you who don't know, is a crew member of a newly commissioned ship. It was decided to limit the number of Plank Owners to 41 to match the number of the Midway. Each plank owner would contribute $25,000 over three years. That would give us a starting point of just over a million dollars and a strong board commitment to hopefully convince other donors. The road to receiving approvals from governmental agencies almost proved to be our downfall. In 1997, we submitted to NAVC the 12 required copies of the application. David was awash in paperwork. A year earlier, we had submitted our environmental impact report to the Port of San Diego, and we felt we were making real progress. 
Four months went by and a hammer fell. We learned that the Navy, along with four other governmental agencies, had been working on what they called the North Embarcadero Development District, which fittingly had the acronym of NERD. <laughs> it was a comprehensive plan encompassing a mile and a half of waterfront from Navy Pier to the Coast Guard Station. An architect from San Francisco had been commissioned to create a vision for this stretch of waterfront. He left the midway out because he said it wouldn't fit in. We were completely blindsided. We had been dealing in good faith and we were stung. So we decided to launch an all-out offensive. Most of our plank owners were politically influential business leaders. In turn, we recruited other community leaders to join our fight. We sat in meeting after meeting, some stretching late into the night. The skirmish took two years and a lot of heartache, but we had wonderful supporters. I remember one city council meeting that lasted almost to midnight. A local citizen was railing against the midway, shouting that it would completely block the view. A very tired and impatient council member, Harry Mathis, took a long pause, looked at her and said, Madam, the midway is the view. In the meantime, Midway was sitting in Bremerton gathering rust. A few members, along with a retired Navy commander named Pete Clayton, traveled to the state of Washington to check out the ship and create a to-do list for a move to San Diego. We were confident we were going to move her to San Diego. Those two years, though, cost us time and money. Once again, the floors came to the rescue as financial backers. Two updated editions of the application were sent off and a bank agreed to a guarantee of a loan of 3.5 million using 13 personal guarantees from project supporters as collateral. Thanks to Malin Burnham for his prowess in creating a winning plan. Other hurdles. We had to hire a towing company approved by the Navy to move the ship from Bremerton to San Diego with a stop in Oakland for a paint job. We wanted her to look beautiful when she steamed into the harbor or was towed into the harbor. In order for the Midway to become a historical museum, we needed a curatorial staff. We hired George Cagle, an experienced curator who immediately went to work. The results of his labor are evident today. By the way, we continued submitting application updates to the Navy. It took 10 years to finally get approved. As to a Navy ship at a Navy pier, well, the pier belonged to the Navy, but the water space belonged to the port from whom we needed a long-term lease. I'll bet you didn't know there was water space. Well, some of you don't. I sure didn't. We were also required to apply for a lease from the California State Lands Commission for the portion of the carrier's bow protruding into the airspace beyond the Navy Pier. Now, is that bureaucracy or what? That was an environmental requirement. We then had to appear before the scariest group, the California Coastal Commission. <laughs> Some of you have done that, I can tell. It had regulatory oversight over land use and public access in the California Coastal Zone. Theirs was a crucial vote. The port had advised the commission that we were going to submit our plan for approval at their next meeting. Assurances were needed before they would approve. We had to agree to allow free public access, to provide comparable mitigation for the shadow midway cast on the eel grass. Right, Scott? I had to check that. We had to move parking off the pier within 10 years of opening, and we had to work with the port to create a veterans park, which we're still doing. We had our work cut out for us. Fortunately, the vote was to come up when the commission met here in San Diego in March of 2001, and we were ready for them. We packed the meeting room with supporters, many of whom spoke on our behalf. They included 50 Pearl Harbor survivors, astronaut Wally Shira, then Mayor Dick Murphy, plus the board and all the volunteers working on the project. It was standing room only. Each person was given a small American flag, which they waved with great enthusiasm. Faced with that audience and our comprehensive plan, the vote was a unanimous yes. Yes, and we passed the biggest hurdle to date. The Navy was soon to declare the Navy pier as surplus with a 10-month waiting period to see if anyone applied for the rights. 
It was agony when we learned that four other groups said they would make an application, including an Indian tribe who claimed the pier was on the site of their ancestors' sacred hunting grounds. <laughs> no, it's true. We were told that contrary to rumor, they were not putting a casino on the site, but would grant us a very favorable lease. The ultimate decision was left to the Secretary of the Navy. Ten months later, SECNAV announced the pier would be granted to the San Diego Car Aircraft Carrier Museum, provided we met the terms, terms set out by Congress. We were so ready to celebrate, but knew more had to be done. Then came the tragedy of September 11th. Everything came to a halt as our nation and our city dealt with stunning grief. At that point, the Navy wanted even more guarantees from a Sunday funding and visitor projection standpoint to ensure San Diego could survive a similar disaster. Our proposal had projected we would reach 600,000 visitors in the first year. We revised our financial projections to 440,000 visitors, and they seemed happy with that. The cost of repairing the degrading Navy Pier was an ongoing concern. Thanks to Senator Steve Peace for obtaining an $8 million government grant to get that job done. Finally, in 2003, SECNAV approved the project. After 11 years, we signed a formal contract and the ship was ours. The caveat was she always had to be maintained as a war-ready vessel. After all that we had been through, we thought, that's a piece of cake. <laughs> we now had to get her towed from Bremerton to Astoria for some final cleanup. <laughs> the Columbia River had dropped nine feet due to a drought, making it too shallow for our ship to reach Astoria. Thanks to some personal contacts, we were able to find a mooring site in the port of Oakland. At the same time, negotiations were ongoing with the Port of San Diego for repair work on the Navy Pier. Plus, we needed a skipper for the ship. We hired Rear Admiral Mac McLaughlin, the best move we had ever made. <laughs> Mac was a recently retired admiral in charge of all Naval Air Reserve Ops in the United States. He was perfect for the job, and Mac, you still are. And then on January 5th, 2004, late on a beautiful San Diego afternoon like today, we watched the Midway sail well towed into San Diego Bay and moor at North Island Air Station where she received a final cleaning of all her public spaces. We had hired a caterer for the arrival party and that company was busy loading tables and chairs and other equipment which would be set up during the short tow from North Island to Navy Pier. The entire team was on board for the short trip across the bay what a surprise to see hundreds of people on Navy Pier waiting for the Midway. They watched as she was gently docked into place. It was emotional, really emotional for us all. One of my personal best moves was in 1996. I recruited a friend who I knew to be a public relations guru, Scott McGaw. We had lunch and I asked him to do, Scott, would you just do a few months of pro bono work? He owned one of San Diego's top marketing agencies. What began as a three-month commitment from Scott now stands at 22 consecutive labor of love years and counting, and we're lucky to have him. He's gonna tell you the rest of the story. I just wanna tell you a little bit about Scott. He is the Midway's long time uh, director of marketing. He's a San Diego native and graduated from Arizona State after studying international relations in uh, Sweden. And for a sh very short time, he owned a newspaper in Durango, Colorado. Years later, he did return to San Diego in 1995 and built a well-known PR agency, then started volunteering here on the quest to procure the Midway in 1996. As Patty said, his original commitment was simply to help out for three short months volunteering with the news media on behalf of Patty and the other volunteers. Just a little kind of fun thing for the summer. However, that was not the case. We got him. We reeled him in. Never intending to become the Midway's founding marketing director, he started in December of 2004 and yelled yes on the spot when asked. But then he had to figure out how to sell his PR agency. 
And now three months has turned into 22 years and counting, and he says he has never done anything as rewarding as being in the Midway family. Ladies and gentlemen, my friend, Scott McGaw. Thank you. For the record, I was 12 at the time. Just, just so if you start doing the math, uh, I'm, I'm sure I was just 12. Uh, it is a delight to share this, this legacy, this, this odyssey, really, um, to, that has led to where we are t tonight. Take a look at the screens. First of all, let me set the stage. How many of you have been at a holiday dinner with the grown kids and mom and dad start telling stories after a couple glasses of wine and the kids turn to them and they say, we never heard those stories. Or the kids do the same and then mom and dad, we never heard those stories. This is what, I already heard some tonight from Patty. You're gonna hear some from me tonight. That was the original vision. It was not the USS Midway. It was the USS Ranger. That was Alan's first thought uh, back in 1992, thinking that the Ranger was probably going to become available before the Midway was. And his vision was to build a pedestrian pier straight out from the county administration building. That's where Midway was supposed to be uh, in the very, very, very beginning. For a lot of reasons that didn't work out, uh, it quickly became evident it wasn't going to be viable. Uh, the Midway began uh, to become, seemed to become available. Um, there were all kinds of issues about how deep the water had to be for an aircraft carrier. And the reality is Navy Pier was the only pier in San Diego Bay that was deep enough for Midway that did not require dredging. Had we not been able to get Navy Pier, Midway would not be here today. No one wanted to start dredging uh, San Diego Bay and again, all the environmental issues and selenium from the Navy and that sort of thing. So this vision that you see on, this, on the screen quickly gave way to what we are, where we are tonight uh, and what we have tonight. Uh, this is Bremerton, this is Midway up in Bremerton. Uh, rusting away, uh, it's an amazing place, the Navy mothball fleet. Uh, at one point, as, as um, Patty mentioned, we were getting close to uh, getting Midway. We knew we had to start getting Midway ready up there. Uh, it's behind lock gates. We had to get Navy permission. Uh, we sent up a crew at one point. They took 9,000 bags of trash off this ship. Now, go home. Think about how many glad bags that is, trash bags, out to the trash can. Multiply that by 4,000 or more. That's what was taken off just uh, from the ship itself, covered in uh, bird droppings, thousands of uh, pistol shell, cartridge shells. Uh, they had been using it for security training purposes. So there were shotgun shells and rifle shells and 22 long rifle shells, uh, cartridges, all over the ship. Who knew? Um, but all that had to be done before we could even think about towing Midway at three and a half knots, Th 13 days. Um, uh, all the way down the coast uh, before Midway got here. Now, now Patty's kind of glossing over some things. You know, and David would kind of do, oh, we need to go into Oakland uh, for a quick paint job. 175,000 feet of paint. Uh, after assuring San Diego this would not become a rust bucket, we could not bring Midway into San Diego after sitting up in the mothball fleet for 13 years. That is just a brief shot of what Midway looked like uh, up in Oakland. I think, David, it was about two months thereabouts. It was up in Oakland uh, to get Midway ready for the final tow um, down. We missed a huge fundraising opportunity. I can't tell you how many Midway sailors called me and said, whatever the price is, uh, my, my will, whatever it takes, I want to ride midway down the last 150 miles. I'll take a sleeping, my own sleeping bag, my own food, don't care about bathrooms. I want to sleep on Midway's flight deck those last 15 days down from Oakland or whatever. Lloyd's of London, at a premium cost of $500,000, said no. No one could be on the ship you know, other than a couple personnel people from a safety standpoint. So we, we, we couldn't do that as Midway was pulling out of Oakland, um, looking a lot better than what you see here in this photo. Uh, and as Patty said, arrived uh, late 2003. We had Mac on board and not much else. About a week later, if I remember correctly, uh, towed across the bay, as, as Patty mentioned. It was a gorgeous day, first week in January. You look at that photo taken by the Navy. It's, it's, uh, those tugs are turning up a whole lot of the bottom of San Diego Bay. Uh, 
no one mentioned that at the time, uh, fortunately. Uh, but we got a, uh, over to the pier, and I remember Mac telling me later, he took one look at the ship, uh, realizing uh, well, how much had to be done and wondered what the hell he had gotten into. Because it was no fool's errand, but Dave Floor and Patty Roscoe told him they wanted the ship open by April 1st. Three months, ready, set, go. Well, I can tell you uh, that was not even remotely possible. I will not read this list to you, but this was the beginning of our to-do list on January 10th, 2004, and we wanted to open June 1st. We could not financially miss another summer tourist season. You know, when there were three million visitors, three million residents in San Diego, 35 million vi uh, tourists, we could not miss the summer tourist season. This is the beginning of a list, and some of those bullet items are, mis are misleadingly simple uh, compared to what they actually entail when you look at it in terms of staff and computers and bathrooms and drinking fountains and, oh, what do we do about grandfathers and wheelchairs and strollers for a ship that was built for 19-year-old sailors. Ready, set, go. We got six months. We had Mac and not much else. Um, but that begins to give you a sense of what we were facing. A couple of before and afters. This is what... Um, uh, Patty and David turned over to us in January, uh, even after the paint job of primarily the hull. Uh, not the best looking uh, island you'd ever see. Um, after promising San Diego that Midway would be kept in, in cherry condition, this is what it looked like six months later. You know, some of these photos weren't taken literally on grand opening day, but pretty darn close. It'll give you an idea. 90% of this work was done by San Diegans volunteering their time and oftentimes buying their own paint. I, I, there are so many stories I can't begin to take the rest of the night uh, explaining all that from the flight deck surfacing to the island and so on. It's just remarkable inside and out what they got done, for example, in the island. This cave was the forecastle, the forecastle. Important part of the planned tour. We wanted to have it open. It was relatively accessible in horrible shape. Each one of those links weighs about anchor chain, about 135 pounds apiece, covered in rust. Uh, and there were hundreds of them up there, much less the rest of the cave. Six months later, it looked like that. This one, largely because of the Navy. This actually photo was taken a little bit after grand opening, but the Navy uh, personnel, I think it was chief petty officers, if I remember correctly, volunteered from a community service standpoint to come over and literally get down their hands and knees and scrape the rest off link after link after link and repaint. And, and they certainly knew what they were doing in terms of where logos ought to go and on a typical uh, forecastle and so on. Um, we were so blessed in so many places around this ship and from so many quarters in San Diego to make this possible. This is where you are tonight. That's the hangar deck. Um, that equipment you see down below there on, in, at the bottom of the photo is actually the innards of the catapults. Uh, tons and tons of steel had been pulled out of the catapults and stored down here on this very hangar deck uh, for literally 12, 14 years in, in Mothball. All that had to go before we could pick up a paintbrush, think about an audio tour, think about a bathroom, think about a, a fountain, a drinking fountain, uh, think about where we're gonna park strollers and that sort of thing six months later almost all by volunteers. The air wing. There were dozens and dozens, if not hundreds of San Diego volunteers while Patty and David and I and Alan and a whole bunch of other people were chasing, getting Midway, who were volunteering their time over at North Island, acquiring and restoring aircraft on the come that there would someday be an aircraft carrier to park them on. To me, that's just extraordinary. Uh, and they did it for years, uh, purely in the belief that we would be successful. That's the range of conditions some of the aircraft were over the course of years, just to give you a representative sample. And if you haven't been up on our flight deck lately, it's extraordinary what they look like. I can't tell you how many guests from around the world ask us if these planes are ready to launch. Uh, we say, yeah, the docents often say yes, but that's another story. They don't let facts get in the way of a good sea story, but it's just extraordinary uh, when you look at, at the detail up there and then the constant war against rust and oxidation that they, they fight every single day to keep it world class, and it truly is world class. Some of our basic challenge was just getting people aboard. Didn't know how many people were coming, but we had to get them aboard, all ages. Uh, so this is just, again, a, kind of a representative sample of the kinds of assembly we had to do. We begged, borrowed, or perhaps stole Navy brows. I think they're on loan 14 years later. They're on loan. We're hoping nobody notices. That upper left-hand photo, a lot of people don't realize we are not tied up to Navy Pier. 
Never were. We had to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars, if I recall correctly, to build mooring platforms strong enough to withstand the strongest winds recorded in San Diego Bay, 65 knots. And that's where the Navy would allow us to tie up Midway permanently, not directly to the pier or certainly solely to the pier. So we actually had to build these uh, at the same time in those same six months, actually before that, because uh, these had to be ready uh, at a cost of six figures before Midway could even arrive in San Diego and get tied up safely and securely. Uh, so that ultimately we would have a ticket booth like this. This is a more recent photo. But we learned so many things. Uh, I remember walking on the pier one time and Mac and I were looking at the ticket booth. I remember there was a sign, USS Midway Museum, at the top of the ticket booth. Couldn't see it from the far side of the pier. We had planted, painted the letters black. And against the gray background, you couldn't see it 50 feet away. <laughs> All right, guys, repaint the USS Midway, make it white this time. Now, now our guests could find the ticket booth. A big thing that we went through for the six months, and even today, is what we don't restore, or when we will restore it. There are so many places on this ship we could restore if we could find a way to get six, seven, eight thousand people a day of all ages through them from a traffic flow standpoint. It's like a city annexing property. We can't have cul-de-sacs and dead ends on an August day. So on the left is ship's uh, navigation system. Uh, we delayed that one because we wanted the lights to work and, and really almost a reenactment. Uh, that opened five or six years after we opened as a ship uh, here on, in Hangar Bay 2. Uh, the photo on the upper right, that's the print shop. Midway had a daily, a weekly newspaper. Um, you can still smell the mimeograph ink or oil, whatever, down there. It takes me back to elementary school. Um, that's not open, it's restored by volunteers out of the goodness of their heart, not open to the public. Challenges of, of public access, so mostly for behind the scenes, but it's just one of so many places, boiler rooms and so on, that maybe someday we can find a way to recreate or create access safely for all ages uh, to visit Midway. That's what Midway looked like uh, the day we opened, basically that first week. It's an awfully naked looking flight deck, but we were so proud. We had three planes on the flight deck and two or three maybe down here on the hangar deck. Uh, as, you, as you can see there, that upper left-hand photo. Uh, but it just gives you a sense of how, how far we were able to get as, quote, phase one by the time we opened. After 12 years, is anybody going to show up tomorrow? We're going from a 12-year dream led by Patty and David and, and Rudy Shappy, who is here, and a lot of other people, to a seven-day-a-week business and a night event business, maybe five or six nights a week. Um, these people invested thou hundreds of thousands of hours and dollars, and the next day we were going to open the gates. 4,073 people waiting for us to open. First day. Now, here's the rest of the story. These are the, those stories you hear at the at holiday table with the grown kids that you hadn't heard back in, the, in, in real time. Some of these Mac doesn't know. A lot of these the board does not know <laughs> until tonight. I'm hoping 14 years is a statute of limitations before I flip the side. Uh, I've been holding on to this for a long, long, long time. Okay, that gray box is still here today. It's down by the men's room. Um, the first summer we opened, it was flashing red three or four times a day. And people would see that, they'd run, that people in line, they'd run over, look, Uncle John, part of Midway is still operating, still working, and they'd take up 15 photos till they finally think they caught it, you know, with a red light flashing. And isn't that cool? Some sort of pump system. What they did not know is that was the warning alarm light that the men's toilets were about to overflow. <laughs> we were not hooked up to the city sewer. Twice a day, we had unmarked sewer trucks pulling up alongside Midway, running hoses up over here to the men's room and pumping out the tanks. Well, Mom and Uncle Jane and so and Jane and so on are coming aboard. Uh, and anytime we saw that red light, we scrambled. Where the hell's the, the trucks late? Two stories with this photo. We were slow learners sometimes. That hatch on the left, it took. Hangar Bay 2 again, not far from that where that gray box is actually, kind of a jinxed corner of the ship. Several months after we, we opened, somebody took a look at that hatch, that gray door, and thought about the location and the entrance to the men's room, opened that, and that opened directly into stall no toilet number three. 
you would have faced a gentleman facing his back, or he might have been facing you. You think we ought to zip tie it? Probably. <laughs> Didn't even think of it. And we knew the bathroom was there. We built the bathroom. That was actually a fan shop um, it, when Midway was active. And one time, Mac and I were talking to a Midway sailor. He said, oh, I know that. The men's room? Yeah, that was a fan shop, and that's where I cut off my finger. He had part of a finger. So I always think of him and a bloody finger when I go to the bathroom here aboard Midway. Um, that, that wall on the right-hand side was not there when we opened. You know, that, nice plays for our corporate partners that Craig Fisher's putting together, a, a great, great program near, near the gift shop and a good public space. The real reason that is there, that it was probably a year, I would think, that finally a woman was walking, it'd take a woman to notice this, uh, was walking by and at the right point, she could glance into men's open door restroom. There's no doors. And the mirror was positioned just right, <laughs> wait for it, that would show all the urinals in perfect profile. A nice side view. You think we need a wall? Probably. Maybe a week it was up. Still there today. Oh, God. July 4th, 2004, we've been open a month. We have this brilliant idea. Let's make this a family safe uh, place uh, for July 4th fireworks. You know, it's in the bay, uh, make it really easy for everyone. Bring down your camping chairs and your blankets like a park and, and parking and 10 bucks. I think it was five the first year. Um, buy tickets and come down and, and watch the fireworks. Great idea, 3,500 sold out in a heartbeat. They start coming off the ship at 10 p.m. after the fireworks. And of course down here, if you've been down here, it's gridlock down here. And finally, the last people come aboard, get off, um, and we have a couple people with, in wheelchairs. That's how we got them off the ship. And, that, and I don't, if those who don't have um, ever operated a forklift, that thing wobbles up there. It's not a solid, straight, reinforced thing. So we've got Grandpa in a wheelchair. On July 4th, my very good friend Mike Shirk in a wheelchair, I'd known him for years, was the last patient, the last um, guest off the ship. We roll him out onto L2. This is about midnight. Tide had come in, and the ship was too tall, too high. <laughs> that poor guy, engineering, and I waited two and a half hours until the tide turned, dropped back down, could finally roll him off into the basket, down, and, and let he and, and his wife go home. Uh, that's just an example of the things we got away with. Oh boy, this one uh, cost Max some gray hair. And also the first year. Um, he had gone home for the day, probably exhausted at 6 p.m., turns on the local news to see a helicopter hovering over our island with ropes hanging down to a stretcher with someone in it who was being airlifted off the top of our island who had fallen sick when she took an island tour because we had no way to get people down ladders like this and had not yet had time to, for the fire department to train and so on. So he had to explain to his board of directors why we were seeing this woman being flown off, off the screen below a helicopter to, to land to shore somewhere. Uh, we learned quickly we needed some first aid and other kinds of emergency procedures. Today, Midway is used regularly by fire departments of all levels for training, and it's come in handy on more than one occasion when uh, someone's had an issue up on, on the island. Uh, but we learned the hard way this, that first couple of months uh, that we needed to d address that kind of thing very, very quickly. Real quickly, lightning round. Fat lady takes a dive. Uh, first summer we're open, the Greenpeace ship pulls up on Broadway Pier. She's an environmentalist. She wants to join the crew. She takes her clothes off our, on, our, on our flight deck, jumps into the water 50 feet down, swims over the Greenpeace boat. There was a police department was already over there dealing with another woman who had fainted, so they just waited on the ladder for her to climb up the ladder and arrested her. Uh, the first few months, uh, we found a homeless gentleman who figured out how to get onto the ship, and in this entire 2,000 compartment ship, found where we kept the booze. Uh, uh, bar service. Um, uh, drank a couple bottles of wine, slept in a bunk, and, and we had him arrested the next morning. We always had flashlights with us because usually once a day, the lights went out. Every day, we had to make sure someone went to the gas station to buy gas to fill the generator because we weren't hooked up to the city system yet. And if the generator went down, no backup, 4,000 people are aboard, uh, and we had to deal with it, so we always had flashlights with us. Bees found Midway in a heartbeat. There's all kinds of places for swarms to, to 
uh, start building nests here. Same thing with the birds. Never thought about all these aircraft with folding wings. Great spots for nests all over the place. Um, I had 38 different crisis communication scenarios that we had planned for. The pier is too small, the parking, no one shows up, too many people show up, the bathrooms fail, the electricity goes down, all those kinds of things. No one expected a 6.3 earthquake off Rosarito. And I'll tell you, I'm a native. I was amazed at how it feels like a real earthquake on this ship. The water doesn't temper it. Uh, we had a lot of white-faced people from Kansas City wondering what the hell was going on. Um, we told them it was simulated flight ops up on the flight deck. They bought it, you know. Uh, we took our cue from the docents. Uh, don't let facts get in the good way. Lake Midway, first winner for Midway. Third winnest winner in San Diego history. See the pallet here? There was no drainage on Navy Pier. We had three inches of water, two acres wide. How do they get to the tech ticket booth? Well, our crack engineering department laid down hundreds of pallets, and so in heels and sandals, you were walking on the pallets over the water to get to the ticket booth until we finally found a way to vacuum the water. We had no radios, we had no cell reception. This is the largest ship in the world uh, with so much steel where you don't have cell reception. So if you get a call, a business call, somebody wants to book Midway, you'd have to take a message. You really couldn't call them back on your cell phone. Uh, you couldn't call anybody on the radio. You'd have to either come to the hangar deck or out onto the pier and then return the call. Um, not the best way to start a business. Um, Talked about the city power, city sewer. Uh, we want to make sure we got all of our emails taken care of first thing in the morning because the internet would go down every afternoon. Uh, we had old com 286 computers, for those who know, donated from businesses. We couldn't afford computers yet. Uh, so you really want to get things done because I think they all got tired, the computers, about 11 a.m. Uh, and they would go down. Uh, we never expected scalpers uh, buying tickets and selling them at a premium. What do we do about that? And there are all kinds of things. Um, people would bring 12-year-olds and say, we're sending our 12-year-old twins aboard. We'll be back in a few hours to pick them up. <laughs> Do we allow that? Service dogs, service animals, service cats. Do we allow service cats? Hadn't thought about it. We'd make decisions on the fly and just keep on going. Um, and that's what happened. You know, as I think Patty or, or Jill pointed out, the Navy wanted us to plan for 440,000. We hit 400 in four months a million in roughly over a year. So I would submit like Jill would, and I think Mac, and certainly our founders, Midway wasn't such a stupid idea after all. Today, Jill already touched on a couple of those things. Uh, some of this has really been breaking news here in the, in the last couple of weeks in terms of being you know, number five out of 35,000. That's how many museums are in the US of all types. We're above the Smithsonian in popularity, not because of marketing. All I do is make promises. It's the do I do. Um, it's a great job gig if you can get it. Uh, but if the docents and the staff and your support and the volunteers didn't deliver on that promise to 1.4 million people from around the world, we'd be out of business. Like we're a business at the end of the day. We can get all carried away about our noble cause, and that's why we come to work every day and so on. But we knew from the beginning, Patty and David were crucial in telling us every, all the time, we are a business. We need a good financing plan. We need staffing. We need to cap be capitalized. We need a maintenance plan, just like any other business. Uh, the noble cause will come later, so to speak. And that's why we're here today. It's really the decisions these people made 25 years ago to set the foundation and the philosophy to make it possible. But we're not done. We know the Battle of Midway. The second Battle of Midway was getting Midway here. The third battle was probably getting through the, uh, the first year uh, with some of these things, and I haven't told you all the stories. And really, the fourth Battle of Midway is g going forward, the constant war against rust um, that will never end, whether it's the aircraft or the ship structure or, 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 or anything else. We have, we're very fortunate. We have a great chief engineer who's taken the reins from Charles Gordon, Len Santiago, and Len is going to share a little bit with you in terms of looking forward, uh, the kinds of things that he's working on behind the scenes, literally, so that we can be structurally viable, uh, we maintain structural integrity, so we can keep building on the momentum that we've generated so far, again, largely with your support. So thank you very much, and I'm going to turn it over uh, to Jill to introduce Len. <laughs> That was great. I want to tell you about Len Santiago. He is our new USS Midway chief engineer. And as chief engineer, he knows everything about this ship, inside and out, top to bottom, everything. 
Len arrived earlier this year, taking the helm from the very capable founding chief engineer, our friend Charles Gordon, who is here with us tonight. In 1988, Len graduated from UC Berkeley in biophysics and then the Naval Postgraduate School and MS in mechanical engineering. He served 23 years in the US Navy as a surface warfare officer focusing on ship readiness, engineering ship operations, and logistics. Len served aboard the USS Lake Champlain, the USS Russell, and the USS Peleliu. After the Navy, he taught Navy ship operations, propulsion, damage control, and logistics management to Navy personnel for many, many years. Len now has embarked on a comprehensive ship preservation program doing what he calls the 50-year fix for Midway. And nobody laughs as loud or as happily as this man. Len Santiago. Thanks, Jill. Um, it's a privilege and honor, ladies and gentlemen, to be here with you tonight. Uh, my lovely wife, Marsha, the Mrs. Chief Engineer is here tonight. And, uh, and I owe a lot to my naval career. Uh, I'm going to tell you when Lieutenant J.G. Santiago in 1991 was on USS Lake Champlain, it was my first time experiencing Midway during Operation Ferry Vigil. Because here I'm calling out to the bridge, bridge combat, USS Midway on the port bow, constant bearing, decreasing range as we were evacuating Subic Bay. And that blip got bigger and bigger and bigger. Bridge combat, wake up the captain. We, we are on CBDR, and as soon as I ran to the bridge, we were, uh, Matt could have golfed right off the bridge of the Lake Champlain onto the flight deck of the Midway. Uh, little I realized in 2017, 18, I'll be back to Midway, and, uh, and it's an incredible job. This is a dream of a, of a surface warfare officer. And what I'm going to share with you tonight is the incredible efforts that a lot of folks before me um, as part of 243 years of uh, naval tradition, I'm just taking the watch. I'm just another officer stepping up to the plate. Uh, my assistant, you need a Batman with uh, every Robin with a Batman, a Goose with your Maverick. Uh, I have Scott Whaley. Stand up, Scott. He's my assistant here from the on the Midway. And so they also say every ensign needs a chief. So he's my chief, and we're learning as I find out where every toilet is on this ship, and I'm still trying to find them every day. So let me give you a sample of where we're going now. You members have three ships. If you remember, this was built in 45. Then we modded it in 1950 to add 9.5 degrees of a bow. Then in 1970, the Navy said, let's hit it again and add 13.5 degrees. So you below your feet is the original construction. Above your head is probably the last great naval architecture design of redoing the ship. And I find it amazing as I go through 13 triwalls of engineering diagrams underneath your feet that there's engineering diagrams, hand-drawn, penciled, no computers, no iPhones, no nothing. Smart naval engineers designed this ship at the end of World War II to take 34% of damage. So that was the first war, and she is built tough. I've had the privilege to serve uh, or teach on USS Zumwalt and LCS ships. And this ship is looking better than some of the new ships just down the pier. So it's a great responsibility as I work with the volunteers and fellow members here on the Midway. Uh, she did ballistic missile defense, as you see in the upper diagram up to the right. No different probably than destroyers are doing today off Korea. Um, the cross section that you see, that little white diagram, is a thin slice of multiple decks and spaces that I'm still finding fascinating below your feet. It appears to me we've only opened up about 34, 40 percent of the ship. So there's still about 60 percent left of Disneyland underneath. Uh, it's, a little, it's looking like the walking dead down there, but I think with technology and time and the next chief engineer and the next chief engineer and the next chief engineer, you'll have a ship that will be open quite a bit. So there's still plenty more to explore. I just ask you, my members, don't sneak around in flip-flops and shorts as I found a couple of you already walking in spaces. So, <laughs> so what's the mission? The mission is to preserve, and that's what I've taken on personally. On the left-hand side was the engineering department of Midway, 640 engineers. Uh, their task was to prepare this ship for war, like I said, and it went through a lot, Korean, Vietnam, uh, Cold War. Um, today, the mission is to prepare the next future. Uh, the young children I see on the flight deck, um, the, uh, the children I see up in the schools up, uh, that uh, Sarah manages, and my fellow shipmates, or the new shipmates, uh, that are taking the watch. So I'm just another VA number now. 
Um, I just barbecue and cook for my wife and kids and support my children in college as they uh, take, uh, take the money out of my wallet for school. Um, so, at least my wife can find me on a ship here, so she knows where I'm at. And as my son calls it, oh my God, my pops has got a new toy called the USS Midway. So, the ongoing conversion. So, so Scott showed you the early picture on the left. The old LSOs, landing signal officers left, landing multiple fighter jets, prop planes on the right, up on the flight deck. I walk every day up in the superstructure, um, and I see the docents do a wonderful job. Uh, I've seen the other museums. I've gone to Hornet. I've gone to Yorktown. I've gone to the Iowa. Uh, they have all the Gucci electronics, the virtual reality stuff, but I'm going to tell you the docents bring the ship to life. That's better than any virtual reality you can provide when you bring a Navy veteran who's flown a thousand de- um, so, so being, I would consider one of the junior officers, I go up to the docent shops, check in with the Navy veterans in there, get my dose of, of uh, sea stories, and those guys are launching off by the docent shop like it's the first launch I had like on Ronald Reagan. At 10 o'clock, first launch, two F-14s, two F-18s, one EA-6B, one E-2, and the docents dis disappear and go to their stations just like an airplane. And, and it's wonderful. Uh, full of energy, and I can see where the Midway Magic actually brings a lot of energy into the volunteer force. It rejuvenates me. I've got a bunch of all my buddies down on Harbor Drive are going, how did you get that gig? Uh, I don't know. God was good. And like the game of Frogger, you find the good lily pad. You don't burn bridges behind you. Uh, I, served a, I served a couple Jack and Cokes to some retired two stars and said, hey, here's the email to Mac McLaughlin, sir. You know, I, you know I, I didn't get you in trouble, sir, but can you hook me up here? Because this is a good gig, and the defense contracting world is going up and down, up and down, and my wife is saying, we need something steady. Okay, so God was good, and, uh, and we land on this lily pad. So I am greatly appreciate that Admiral McLaughlin uh, allowed me this opportunity. Again, it's an opportunity. Again, only, we, the ship was designed to have 640 engineers. We have 64 of them, okay? Uh, great Americans keeping the ship ultimately clean, but technically you only got about nine or ten that know the difference between a, an iPhone and a 916 wrench, and I'm one of them. Um, so we have to leverage technology. So one of the efforts my, pre my predecessors have set up is these ongoing automatic systems. So if I get a call from Jill or any from the department head saying, hey, Len, I'm too hot, too cold, whatever, if Scott's not nearby, I can break out the iPhone, adjust the temperature, and this is actually better than I've seen on the Zoom Walt in a lot of places. We can maintain the temperatures on this ship, maintain schoolhouses, a school going in session. One time I was stirring nacho cheese at a volleyball tournament for my daughter. I get a call from the education folks. I said, hey, chief engineer, it's too hot down in education. I said, oh, hold on. So I go outside the, outside the volleyball tournament, adjust the temperature, and the temperature was adjusted all the way from Irvine. So we're leveraging new technology right now that my predecessors have set up was just the beginning to modernize a 1945 aircraft carrier to meet the mission of educate and entertain. So I just give you that, that snippet. Uh, A.O. Reed, again, I'll put a shameless plug in. A great company that has been supporting us. And they are sort of our A gang. They're doing the auxiliary piece. They're doing AC piece. They do uh, a lot of the water piece. And then they're our partner with as we remodel and other parts of the ship right now to expand as uh, Mark Berlin and the, and the marketing boss here invite 1.4 million, 1.5 million, 1.6 million, and it, it is just going up. So uh, I, I'm, playing, I'm trying to play catch up with the uh, ongoing marketing here. The other mission is, uh, is as a museum and as for education. And so on the left-hand side, you see that some of our commercial partners have put in bright LED lighting. That way it offsets the uh, bill, as well as educate. So when I, I see the little feet walk by the engineering office and they freak out when they see me actually move and they go, oh my god, that's not a mannequin, he's alive. Um, what I see is a lot of future engineers, mechanical engineers, aeronautical engineers, great leaders going by, and they're going to education, uh, the education classrooms. Those leaders, those young people, just like I'm preparing my children to do, are going to be the, are the next technical leaders as you see on the right. Electromagnetism, electromagnetic aircraft launching system, all right, magnets built by General Atomics up the road here in Rancho Bernardo. I've, I've been on the U.S. at Zoom wall, 4160 electric volts, high electricity, turning the screws, putting electricity into guns, okay? Those are the future engineers that I see on the midway walking in the classroom 
and your effort as well as the effort of the staff here are, are inspiring those youngsters to grow and one day support the Navy or support the country. But it's amazing to see it here as they're ed being taught down the classroom. I see it every day. And it's very inspirational. And I appreciate the education staff, those who wear the yellow shirts around the, uh, uh, around the ship. So what else is going on with the USS Midway? Up in the left-hand corner, you see that we have the San Diego police. They come and practice before the hours. You got the San Diego SWAT team. Your ship is a steel ship with thousands of spaces. It provides them the opportunity to do confined space, you know, in a nice, safe environment before the hours open. Just recently, I had the, uh, I, we started bringing in the San Diego Fire Department. They just built some brand new stations downtown. Young firemen, just graduated, about 80 firemen there, and they came on board. Uh, usually, Navy ships have repair lockers. Of the 640 uh, sailors, they're designed to respond to a fire. Well, you don't have that here. So what do we do to protect this precious, this precious asset called the USS Midway? Well, you train the young, the young firemen on the, just off the brow who are going to protect this ship. And that's what they need to do. So we started the training evolution. They came in. They walked through. 80 firemen came in. We brought them through classroom space up above in the AMD classrooms. And then they went down to the engineering spaces. It gets pretty scary if you're in a place that's dark. Uh, you're wearing heavy gear. You're sweating. Um, some of these young kids are wearing glasses like I do. You put a SCBA mask, self-contained breathing apparatus. You're breathing heavy, okay, and then it fogs up. What's the goal? Put the fire out. Now imagine if you're going three or four decks down. Now you're scrunched in, the space is about 36 inches. What's the goal? Save the midway. And so we get, we're starting to build up that tradition with, and that training evolution with the city. And then last week, or actually the earlier this week, we had the federal fire department come in and their training, all right? At the same time, the museum operations are going. It's an aircraft carrier. You can do multiple operations here on an aircraft carrier. You can launch jets, you can cook, you can, you can do everything, and we're doing that. Um, below us, we had the uh, Air Force PJs, para-jumpers from Arizona. They practice their water insertion and they're looking underneath the ship. I've got the explosive ordnance team up in Point Loma. They call me up, Chief Engineer, we'd like to practice and get underneath the hull of the Midway. Permission granted. Come on over. Just don't scare the party on the flight deck and come up above the surface of the water. <laughs> and don't drink, the, don't drink the beer on elevator three or my booze boss is going to be really mad. Okay? But we allow the EOD guys, the SEALs, in their 13th week of training. They're allowed to come up. You'll see six rib boats come up, 60 young, 60 young sailors right by my parking spot over here in the bow. I'm holding my Starbucks and there's these guys in full gear climbing Climbing a ladder is the width of your beer bottle right now, in full gear. And they climb up, they climb down, they do their practice, their visit board search and seizures, and they're off back to Coronado, all before we open up the museum at 10 o'clock. Up in the upper right-hand corner, you got the naval traditions of, of change of commands. And the first thing I discovered here my first month, Scott Whaley goes, sir, you got to get ready. We got the Girl Scouts coming. I said, OK. There's 1,600 of them. Oh, OK. They're landing by helicopter. I go, we're doing what? <laughs> we're still landing helicopters. Wait a minute, we're a, we're a museum, right? He goes, yes, sir, but they're coming in by helicopters. The Girl Scouts that sell the most cookies come in by helicopters. Ah, you're killing me. Really? <laughs> so the standard swole me. We walk in the flight deck, you know. I tell Mac, I say, Mac, we got the flight deck peeling up and everything. We got FOD hazard and everything. And Mac's like, yeah, you're OK. So I was like, oh, my god. So we spend the first couple of weeks peeling up the non-skid, you know, peeling it because my, my Navy hair's going up. Repaint the 41. And here come the helicopters come in like apocalypse now. <laughs> Coming and swinging around, they come down from Kierna Mesa, but they buzz the tower downtown, probably up at the University Center Club at the 34th floor with all my Navy buddies. And here they come landing down on the flight deck. First wave of girls. 1,600 girls are screaming, and I'm looking up on the bridge going, oh my God, this is for real. Bill McClure, the safety boss, is with me, and I'm like, this is really happening, huh? Yeah, welcome to the Midway. I went, all right, yeah, this is great. This wasn't part of my interview, but okay. <laughs> so we do, live, we do live helicopter operations, so when I tell my fellow engineers and service warfare officers, I said, wow, that's a cool gig. Can I have it? No, too late, I got it. <laughs> so what does it make possible? It is the volunteers. Uh, up on the left-hand side is the main propulsion. You used to have the MP division. You had the guys 
put in the hard work and turning make those screws go roundy roundy. On the right is all the volunteers. I see up in the restoration, I have restoration volunteers, about 50 of them. We got those on the flight deck. You got the docents, you have education, you have, you have those helping in exhibits. That is an incredible driving force that provides incredible support for the Midway. And so my mission is to support them so they can support the Midway. So one team, one fight, one ship. So what are we looking ahead? The, the fourth battle is the Battle of Rust. So she may look good in here, but my due diligence is to make sure 65,000 tons of raw American steel that we don't roll anymore doesn't dissipate over the next 50 years so the next chief engineer and the next staff and next members have this. So we're looking at, we're looking at restoration and some, some preservation up on our 100-foot mast all the way to the top. During the Christmas holidays, I, we looked at my, I looked at my skinniest guy in my engineering department, Joe Dunn, and I said, are you okay climbing all the way to the mass? Yes, sir. Okay, take this camera, take some pictures for me. Um, we're doing a lot of island restoration. We're doing a lot of tanks and voids. We have hundreds of tanks and voids below us that require us to go take a look at, and we're doing that right now. Uh, we're doing a lot of, a, we need to do some uh, uh, inspection and dehumidification. Water is bad. It's a basic high school experiment. So we got to figure out how to make sure we keep the places dry. Uh, just recently, the movement's taken place to build another elevator on the pier with the city of San Diego and the Port Authority on the piers. The numbers are growing. Uh, I don't want to put another person in a basket like Scott was showing. I was like, can we put them in an elevator? So we're going we're gonna to work, we're gonna work down to that path and build that. And then we're going to look at the next generation of volunteers. So Sometimes when I get together with my fellow naval officers and chiefs at choir practice, is, which is the code word for just go to the O Club or something, they, uh, I said, why don't you come over to the Midway for a while? You need a new life, you know, you don't want to travel anymore, defense contracting. So, so we're putting that advertisement out. You got to find the next wave to take care of Midway for another 50 years. So that's what we're looking at. So for the members, appreciate your great support. Again, I'm just the new guy here. I've just assumed the watch on May 11th at 0730 Pacific Standard Time for some great people before me. I'm just moving forward just like the officer deck and engineering officer of the watch, just assuming the watch. Uh, the picture on the left you see there, Chief of Naval Operations saying thank you to a lot of the Midway veterans and that was a very impressive moment on the flight deck. And one thing you don't want as a Naval officer, your members, do not, do not forget where you came, come from. So those, people, so those people and those with them sacrificed a lot to be here. Um, Scott does a wonderful job. Every time we get indications that ships are coming home, put the and Mako is, it makes it important we do this. Welcome home. I remember as a young ensign, a JG lieutenant on, on Lake Champlain, Russell, um, Peleliu, and the Ronald Reagan, um, coming home down the San Diego Channel, taking marks, navigation marks off San Diego, uh, it meant a lot. But when you're on a Navy ship and you see "Welcome home" on the bow of the Midway. That, I know those sailors know we are home after a six month, seven month, nine month deployment. And it's like Christmas morning, you've never feel, felt it before. Um, and that on the right is potentially the next F-35 jet pilot, the next chief of naval operations, the next, uh, the next uh, Admiral C C Commander Pacific Fleet, the next commanding officer of the USS John F. Kennedy. Maybe he's the next chief engineer, chief engineer in the year 2030, 2035. So again, my goal, my mission here with you supporting the, the staff and the volunteers is to preserve. Preserve the hard work that's been invested in the Midway, all the assets that's been in the, in the Midway. We are haze gray underway on the USS Midway in our own special way. So I appreciate the opportunity and thank you for your time. <laughs> Okay, we've got question and answers. Anybody, uh, you've got to have some questions. I know you want to know some of these uh, interesting stories here. What was the most difficult area to restore and prepare for public viewing? Viewing. I wasn't involved in, in all that kind of detail, but I would imagine probably the engine room. Uh, because so much of what we have to do in many places on the ship is it's not restoring the space, it's creating civilian style stairs and the access uh, to spaces. Uh, there are many places we've spent far more time and money working on the access than the brig itself or the engine room another three decks down. 
And so just logically thinking for a moment, there might be others that had more difficult technical challenges, but the farther down in the ship you go, you're, you're restoring and rebuilding and designing from scratch. There are no elevators that Otis owns that fits the USS Midway. Everything is done by scratch and designed from scratch, so probably the engine room is what comes to my mind just because of its remoteness. What type of restoration happens on a daily basis? Good question. So the typical battle rhythm I have with my folks on a daily basis, we actually, my staff work 24 hours, mostly in the day, then the second load is in the evening. So it's everything from basic corrosion prevention, maybe stopping the corrosion first, okay, prepare the surface, and then the second shift comes in with the proper priming and painting. Third shift in the midnight, it may be into heavy bending and welding. And the one careful thing we have to do with restoration is the use of paints, use of welding, use of uh, things that may spread through the air. So it has to be carefully planned not to interfere with the normal operations of the USS Midway today, which can start anywhere from 7.30 in the morning to a party in here that goes till 0001, okay? And, and it has to be carefully, tactfully planned. So I sit with our, our reservation, I sit with our event planners, the party girls, I look down and look at the numbers. I see where the windows are at. And then uh, we, we, almost like a surgical strike, we have to tactically place our, reservation, our, our preservation within the reservations and then go around and go, okay, are you okay? Are you okay with this? And do one, final, one more brief with my folks. So it's a careful balance. And then nighttime, metal work. And then it's careful balance with the contracting work too. So we balance the restorations with the, with the commercial contractors all the way from abatement, uh, demolition, to building, to final touch-ups, to a final running of power and electricity, before I can tell Mac and the leadership, we're thumbs up, ready to open this up on this day, so. I am Len's worst nightmare, the marketing department. <laughs> you know, we're open as a museum seven days a week, 363 days a year. And for those who don't know, we're averaging about 275 private events at night. That's almost six nights a week. You know, and, and as he pointed out, this event started at 6 p.m. That's typical. A lot of events don't end until 10, 11 o'clock, and then there's the loadout. So he's got, you know, we accept reservations up to three years in advance for the evening business. So we're a museum by day, event venue by night, which really limits uh, I can't imagine how much more limiting it is for him and what he has to do here compared to, you know, on, on a Navy ship. Uh, but great collaboration, as he said, everyone sits down, figures it out, uh, compromises, whatever, finds solutions so he can get that fundamental work done uh, that we know is so important. Yeah, I heard earlier that one of the Navy requirements was to keep the ship in, I believe the term was war-ready condition. Where are you on that? <laughs> Well, unless the aliens invade, like in the movie Battleship, uh, that, that is not actually the requirement by the Navy anymore. It, the, mat, the, the, the requirement in accordance with our annual inspection with uh, NAVC 21I and ACT ships is ensure that the ship is materially preserved for the goal of not bringing embarrassment on the United States Navy. So, but we still have to follow the rules of environmental impacts, uh, uh, be professional about it. And then once a year, Na the, the Naval Sea Systems Command sends a team of Navy, Navy staff, they come here, and do their annual inspection of the ship. In the active duty Navy, it's every three or five years, which is called the Board of Inspection Survey. That requirement is to see if you're fit for combat service. I think materially, we can do it with any, with any money you can give. You know what the challenge would be? Is the knowledge of personnel. The mind may be strong, but the bodies are weak on anybody to, to, to bring up 12 boilers. You bring up 12 boilers, six EVAPs, and bring it online in accordance with procedures. That knowledge is trapped in a lot of your senior volunteers on board here. In fact, one of them specifically, is, uh, his brain opened up like a 19-year-old uh, when we were doing the nitrogen oxygen room pre-piece and preparations for the restoration back. We could not find the technical documentation that told us what was buried in this tanks except for Jimmy Hoffa's body. <laughs> so 
I brought him together with the contractor, because the contractor and I was concerned. We're going, how are we going to get in these tanks? So Bob sat in the room. I said, Bob, spit out your brain and tell us what's in these tanks. And he spat them out like he was 19 years old in an engineering plant. I went, OK, do you feel comfortable cutting this thing open now? Yep, let's proceed. I got a bathroom to build. So, so we're underway. I have a question for Patty. So looking back, why did you hang in so long? Because it was the right thing to do, and I'm most proud of what you see here today. Mm. That's it. Short and sweet. Yes, Jill. in the back, yes. Who wrote that newspaper article, and have you talked to him lately? Oh. I don't think he's around anymore, Weldon Jones. I'm, I'm not sure if he is either. Uh, Weldon Jones, I think he's yeah. still around. Um, he had that opinion, and, and there were some folks who did, who opposed Midway. Uh, by the time, as Patty described, we got to the Coastal Commission, which was the final hurdle. You know, 2,300 pages of documentation for the Navy, more than two dozen permits. That all had to be in place before we got to the Coastal Commission. And at that point, 84% of San Diego supported what we were trying to accomplish uh, here at Navy Pier with Midway. But there was some vocal minority uh, opinion. Uh, we were going to block the view. We were going to fail as a business, uh, as Weldon pointed out. Uh, but it was fairly isolated by the time the final Coastal Commission hearing came along. And um, until tonight, we have resisted saying nanner nanner. Uh, I think Mr. Jones probably has a really bad stomach ache from eating so much crow. I, uh, this I will, is kind yes. of related can I just, to. Can I just add something? Um, what's interesting is we are a success. And there are people who told us it couldn't be done. It would never happen. We'd be a rust bucket who take complete ownership over its success. So yeah, now, now oh. they do. And uh, that's OK. They're big supporters. And just write us a check. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> the, this is related to what you were just talking about. You're talking about the Port Commission. You're talking about all these government regs, even the Navy. I'm sorry, but yeah, even the Navy. How are your relationships today? Are they supporting you? Are they right there as they should be? Or is there still the na-na-na-na? Which they are you referring to? Any of them. Oh, um, sure. Um, I can answer that from then and now. Excellent relationship with the port. Uh, they were in the middle of a master plan update. Uh, it's clear they recognize the need for parking on Midway and being reasonable about park requirements. It's got to be all worked out and so on. Um, and they have, most of them, been very supportive from the day Midway came. Navy Pier has the cheapest downtown parking rate from the very beginning, in part to help give Midway a running start, if you will. The port didn't really have to do that. So they're on a staff level, and even port commissioner level, uh, very collaborative. The Navy's been marvelous. You know, as Len pointed out, from a training standpoint, cross promotions from a marketing standpoint, uh, and so on. Um, it's really, I guess, and I think about it for a moment, once we got here and kind of established our bona fides after a couple of years, it's really been smooth sailing in terms of the community, San Diego Tourism Authority, um, Airport Authority, all those folks, whenever we need something or they need something, uh, we're a great community resource in terms of providing this is a venue space for their meetings or a fundraising activity or so on. Because we're financially successful, we can afford to be. So becoming a, a community resource and a community partner with the organizations that you're talking about as what the Girl Scouts and that, um, it, it, it's, that's been a big part of Midway's success. And because we keep our word. That's a great point. David and Patty and others and Rudy, you know, made huge promises that maybe saddled, you know, Mac and us that we had to, you know, abide by in order to get the, the approval. And that some of them we wish maybe they hadn't been made, but they had to be made. And we've honored every single one of those. I can't think of one thing that anyone has been able to call Midway out on that you said you were going to do this back in 2002 and it hasn't been done, or whatever it might be. And, and not just the staff and MAC, but certainly the volunteers deserve a great deal of credit for that. Okay. Yes, over here, Priscilla. Yeah, I, um, I seem to recall right after you brought the Midway in, it had to be repositioned at some point. 
which leads me to ask, does this ship actually float or is it sitting or what's the, what's the situation? With it? If we repositioned it, it was only a few feet here at the pier. Once we got here, we were here. One of the great advantages of 12 years to bring Midway here is we had a whole lot of time to do planning. Uh, with all the delays that Patty described. And the other historic naval ships, all in all, were very forthcoming in explaining to us what lessons learned. And one of the lessons the Lexington told us down in Corpus Christi is float. Don't pour in a bunch of concrete. Sit on the bottom so you're nice and stable. And then every change of the sandy tide, the sand is sawing through your hull because you're not moving with the tide. Uh, and we took that advice to heart. And so one of my wisecracks, one of the media or whatever, is we're like any other museum in Balboa Park. The only difference is we go up and down with the tide twice a day. Um, I, part of my career was uh, doing missile testing on ships and everything, and I'd go to different ships, and it, it never failed that they would stick me in the same stateroom as the chief engineer. No sleep. None. I mean, not for me, not for the chief engineer. And then the next day, you go to the wardroom, and it's like, and they're, well, how'd you sleep last night, sir? I didn't. <laughs> but my question is, is since you're the chief engineer, what is probably the weirdest thing you've seen on this ship so far? Because every ship has their little quirks about it. And anyway, I just... Go ahead. Well, I mentioned the Girl Scouts landing, so that was number one. Um, you know, it's not, it's not weird. It's, it's, it's the uniqueness that we built this ship. Your feet are, under, are, are on two inches of thick armor that we don't make anymore. The flight deck is three inches of armor we don't make anymore. The inner, inner guts of the engineering plant are a citadel of two inches of armor protecting from sewage systems to the main propulsion system. Uh, the one thing I showed you on my slide, it's, there are four zones of voids on the outer side skin of the ship. Why? Because if she was built at the end of World War II for torpedo attacks. The bottom of the ship is doubled hull. Why? Torpedo attacks. And you remember the Exxon Valdez, she wrecked and ripped apart, she was a single hull. What, is the what do they do now when they build down a NASCO? Double hull. Well, Midway did it right the first time. So it's not the quirkiness. It's, and call me an engineer geek with a pocket protector, because um, I think I burned half my brain cells in Thailand or something like that. It's the amazing uh, American might that built this, and it's 72 years old, and she's still floating supporting your mission today, okay? We don't build ships like this anymore, and you have one. That's what's unique about her. Does that make sense? So. Thank you. Yes. I have a question for, I guess it'd be towards you, Jill. Um, a while back, you guys did something that was unheard of. I think it's unprecedented. Never before happened in the world, and it happened on your flight deck. A basketball game. <laughs> I'm just wondering if we couldn't do more things on that upper deck, sports-wise or whatever-wise. But whoever thought of that, and what's that like, bouncing a ball on a ship going up and down with the tide? I'm curious. Anything else coming down the pike? Scott will tell you, we get so many requests to do so many interesting things. <laughs> and some of them we do and some of them we don't, and it all goes through his office, his department. My very first request, Midway had been announced it was coming to San Diego, it was six months away from coming. First phone call I got. Playboy wanted to shoot a Playmate spread on Midway. Mid Max still holds it against me that we didn't have a <laughs> casting call. And I just said no right off the bat. He still brings it up. Uh -huh. uh, to answer your question, in, in all seriousness, and we take this very, very seriously. Our number one responsibility 
is the 1.4 million visitors who come from around the world to experience an aircraft carrier and service to our country at sea. Our museum guests come first. So we're very careful about doing things that muck that up, if you will. Now, we've made exceptions, of course. Usually when, more than any other reason, when it's an opportunity to showcase San Diego or Midway to the country or the world. Uh, that carries certain benefits. And we have found our museum guests are generally pretty understanding when we're doing something that clobbers the flight deck for a day or two, as long as we explain it and there's a legitimate reason for it more than, oh, wouldn't it be cool to have an NHL hockey game, which they have asked. No, we're not. Oh, wouldn't it be cool to have cage fighting on national TV? No, it would not. It would not. Uh, the list goes on and on. Back to the basketball game, no, it's not going to happen again. And it's not because of us so much, although it really slammed our, our flight deck for our guests. It was really became something almost dangerous for the players. When you're 1,000 feet out into the bay, 50 feet over the water, it doesn't take much moisture, and you've got a very slick hardwood floor. You know, and some kid with an NBA future, which isn't the only criteria or whatever, the coaches have said, generally speaking, that it's just it's more risky than we were comfortable with. Fox TV then contacted us, and they said, you know, it was great that we did Syracuse, San Diego State, but to really make it worthwhile as a national TV package, we need two games. So we'd have four teams, four regional followings. So if we're going to broadcast it again, it needs to be a doubleheader. That was a deal breaker for all kinds of logistical reasons and so on. We will not, we have not closed Midway, and we've had a lot of six-figure offers because Porsche wants to debut its new model of cars to its top dealers from around the world, and all they want to do is buy out Midway for three days. Huge number. Not going to do it. So in that context, it was great. It was great exposure. It was kind of a fad, if you will. Don't see basketball games coming back to the flight deck. Patty, uh, I and several other people were close to you and uh, Admiral Burke and several other on the Committee of 12 as you went through this process. Um, I think we all marveled at your determination, your tenacity. There were several times over the 12 years that the project was dead. It was kind of like Charlie Brown and Lucy. Uh, Charlie Brown would run up to kick the football and Lucy would pull it away every time. Um, you're an example of the military attitude that defeat is not an option. Uh, we all uh, really are very proud of you and respect and appreciate what you've accomplished. But my question is, over those 11 years, what was the most difficult moment and how did you all stay together and survive it? 80% of the original executive committee in 1992 was still involved in 2004 when Midway arrived with people like David and, and Patty. If they had, not, and these were extremely influential, powerful people with tremendous demands on their time, had they not stuck with it, to your point, Midway wouldn't be here. Uh, that tenacity is something that goes beyond description, particularly with the challenges and disappointments. I think the one that was most discouraging for me after all the other delays was the sudden announcement by the Navy out of the blue that Navy Pier was now a surplus property. We almost had the ship at that point, but we had no home. And the ship donation side of the Navy said, time out. Until you have a home again, Navy Pier or something, the donation process is on hold. And I had to go through that surplus property process with the Navy and SecNav, uh, work with Congress to get some legislation to basically bypass the process so it could be awarded directly to Midway and then the port. That took another year and a half on top of the master plan delay of two years. Uh, that was probably the low point because it was really hard to keep our volunteers, uh, our donors involved with still another delay. You know, we'd make announcements. We were confident Midway is going to be here in two years. Two years later, the reporter would call, mm, maybe another two years. You know, and you talk about integrity and, and keeping your promises that were completely sincere at the time, but things outside your control would hit you between the eyes and, okay, let's deal with that. David, we need more money. We need another three permits and start working the problem and then sticking with it. But here we are. Uh, yes, thank you. I would totally agree with that. The other time that was very tough for all of us was September 11th. It just, mm. it just was. And I don't have to explain to, to all of you 
why. Um, it halted, obviously, everything business, but it halted just our hearts. We just had to, we just had to get all back together. We had to get our city back together. We had to heal, and so we could move on. I think, from my standpoint, it was those two. Thank you for the question. And I'm wondering if you've ever done an event where you've kind of brought together all of the veterans of Midway um, for kind of just one of those final, um, I don't want to say goodbye, but like one of those, those final kind of like uh, uh, reunions sure. with, with kind of their past. Yes and no. There is not a day that goes by that a Midway veteran doesn't walk aboard. I have seen plank owners in their 90s from 1945 being taken out of nursing homes in Florida by great-grandchildren who have no business traveling because they had heard the old girl is alive and well in San Diego and wanted to see her one more time. Tomorrow we have a Midway veteran coming by ambulance. He'll be here maybe 30 minutes uh, in a wheelchair. And one of our docents, a World War II veteran, is, has volunteered to come in and take him on what might be a 30-minute tour because he wanted to see the old girl one more time. I can't tell you how many family members of, those, of Midway veterans who have passed away have come to our extraordinary library and research center. We haven't even touched on that. There are so many dimensions to this ship outside being a museum that they are desperate to find out about their father, and he talked about serving in 1956 on, or 59 on Midway or whatever, and we've got people who are just extraordinary researchers who can piece together bits and pieces of what Grandpa did on Midway. Um, we don't know how many people served on Midway. The Navy doesn't keep lists by ship, and there's all kinds of estimates. If you do the math with certain assumptions, it comes in at 225,000. Other assumptions, it comes in at 150,000. We don't know. Not everybody gets on, a sh on the cruise book list and are different sources. We have volunteers. I just learned the other day and I wrote an article for Currents that these volunteers have proven 86,000 Midway sailors. They have a database now, and they're adding every single day. We have had some Midway Veteran Association events. We've had some anniversary events for major milestones in Midway's history, such as the Operation Frequent Wind, the evacuation of Saigon. Uh, we've had Midway veterans for that event come as, from as far away as Montreal and Vietnamese refugees 40 years later, desperate to find any Midway sailor from any year just to say thank you through their tears. Um, I, I could go on the rest of the night ex giving you examples of the ongoing reunion, the ongoing you know, homecoming, as you just heard from this side. That's not unusual for us. And if that doesn't get you up in the morning and get down here by 0630, nothing's going to. And we talk about being a business, and we are a business. We're always mindful of that. But this is an extraordinarily special place. I would tell you it's almost every day. Okay, I'm the new guy, but uh, I get a call every other day that, hey, uh, this auxiliary guy was in the full refrigerating plant. It's three decks down. I want to go visit it. I'm 70 years old. Uh, the guest, the Vic calls me, hey, Chang, can we do this? I go, hold on. I walk down, I look, and I'm like, uh, this would not be good. Um, and I feel bad. An interesting business note, you've got a lot of veterans that work for the industry just down the street here. And I've seen this spike in my world when I say, hey, I need some help in this particular area. And all the former Midway sailors that work for PCE, NASCO, BAE, they're all coming out of the woodwork going, hey, boss, I wanted that job. I want to go work on that crane. I want to go work on that floor. I want to work. And I went, wow. So every day for me, I, I get about, can we go see? So it's almost a perpetual process, like Scott mentioned. Can you talk a little bit about what's involved in obtaining and restoring the aircraft? Uh, some of them are on loan from the Naval Aviation Museum in Pensacola, uh, basically indefinite loan. Others are on loan from individuals who literally have collected them like old cars. Uh, a number of them have been restored from the frame up. Uh, you know, literally, the planes that were training in World War II crashed into Lake Michigan 
and Lake Michigan is so clear and pure that they can pull those frames out of the water 50 or 60 years later and you can restore them literally from the frame up. So they really have come from a variety of different areas. Um, as you saw in a couple of brief photos, um, no wheels, no, no wings almost, no nothing. It's amazing how often these volunteers, from what I understand, can't find parts cosmetically, and they fabricate them from scratch. You know, you, there, there's no Napa Auto Store that you can go and find a nose gear for an F8 you know, Crusader circa 1963. That's what they're working on right now. There are cracks in the housing or whatever, and they're figuring out ways to re rebuild literally on the flight deck while we stay open as a museum. And again, to, to reemphasize the point one more time, the amount of time, mostly men, but not necessarily, invested as a donation, restoring half a dozen aircraft before we ever knew we would get a ship is just something I'll always be grateful for. And now, uh, I should know, I'll tell my 29 aircraft, and we're within two or three aircraft of maxing out just from a space standpoint. But already, we are rotating two or three at a time off the ship or to a corner of the ship for restoration because as, as Len well knows, including the aircraft, constant war against rust in this very marine environment. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, I wanted to make just a few comments as there are probably a half a dozen people here tonight who were on the original board that went through those 12 years. And we all took different assignments to try and make this thing become a reality. Um, one illustration is uh, when we had no money, yet we had authorization to receive the ship, uh, what do we do to have enough money to stay alive <laughs> until we get the ship and then can get some more money? And um, one of the areas was like the Midway uh, uh, bookstore and behind it the uh, uh, food shop. Uh, we didn't have any money, not a cent. But, uh, so what did we do? We went out and canvassed Coke, Pepsi, and other groups to see who would do the best in giving us some money uh, so that we could open up a uh, food shop on the back of the ship. Um, I'll tell you right now that uh, Coke looked down their nose on us and uh, didn't offer us anything. Uh, through some contacts that we had, uh, we got a hold of Pepsi at the right spot and they stepped up to the plate and gave us a very significant $50,000 type of upfront support before we did anything. Later on, of course, I think Coke is now our uh, favorite vendor, uh, but it took them a while to recognize we weren't a losing deal. We were a heck of a deal sort of thing. And so, uh, you know, 10 years later, uh, Coke did what they wouldn't even think of doing the first time around. There were all kinds of activities like that throughout the whole of the committees that uh, uh, I, I see three of us here, that maybe half a dozen of us here, all worked on pieces of what became a whole. And the whole was made possible once we got it by two things. Outstanding leadership and uh, the fact that uh, Mac figured he had one more shot at doing something good after being an admiral. <laughs> and I think he'll tell you today that uh, uh, his whole career in the Navy was just a proper prep for him leading up this effort. And he has done a magnificent job. The second thing that has made us unique, along with many, many other things that have been recounted, is the volunteer organization. They are, there's no other ship anywhere in the world that has what we have here. We have people waitlisted almost to want to be 
part of, on a volunteer basis, making nothing, uh, supporting this ship in their whole variety of ways. So collectively, we got a ship, we got the people, and we got the leadership, and today we have a brilliant example of what I think America is all about, and more and more people seem to want to see the Midway because it is a really, I think, a fabulous story of what you can do if you get the right people together who believe in something and make it come to pass. I agree. Okay, with that, um, we come to the end of the evening. Thank you so much for being here. You guys are the backbone of this great ship, and we are the America's living symbol of freedom. So thank you so much for coming. <laughs>